Okay, so thank you everyone for joining our webinar, Pivot Your Business During and Post Pandemic with Non-Branded Manufacturing. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Evan Buey and I'm an International Initiatives Officer with Alberta Agriculture and Forestry, uh, specifically working on the export readiness and market intelligence file. Um, for those of you who joined any of my other webinars uh, this past month, um, this will be review, so please bear with me, but for anyone new, uh, this slide's for you. Um, this here is just a quick snapshot of our programs and services and how we support Alberta agriculture companies. So I'm part of the international market development team, and we specialize in supporting Alberta agriculture, food and beverage companies export to international markets. Uh, we help to facilitate export workshops and training sessions such as today's, as well as generate uh, market intelligence. We actually subscribe uh, to a couple of databases and can find you a wealth of information on your products in relation to trends, price competitiveness, uh, competitors, and more. So I'm going to attach a report here later just for interest um, on the evolution of private label, um, because I think it's kind of a relevant topic. So I'll also be emailing this out um, with the recording of the webinar, so you don't have to worry about downloading it right now. Uh, so my team, we also market, um, sorry, monitor market access issues and also help companies navigate free trade agreements. Um, our team is present at major agricultural trade shows around the world. Uh, we build a strong Alberta presence, procuring a pavilion uh, for our clients oftentimes partnering with other Canadian provinces to further leverage the Canada brand. Uh, so typically we try to add more value by coordinating additional programming around a trade show, which may include things like B2B meetings, market overviews, and store tours. Uh, the government of Alberta has 12 international offices abroad with dedicated ag officers at a number of them. Uh, we also work closely with the federal government through the Trade Commissioner Service uh, to tap into their expertise, networks, and buyer connections uh, to help companies enter those markets. So if you're looking for more information, uh, feel, please feel free to reach out. Uh, my contact information is there on the slide. So this slide here, uh, again, might be review for some of you, but I, wanna, I still want to highlight the, the CAP programs that apply to international market development and export readiness. Uh, so these aren't administered through my section, but another department. Um, be sure to check out the CAP website for full details. Uh, but emerging markets, um, the purpose is to enable growth and diversification of Alberta's value added industries through development and commercialization of new or emerging opportunities in the sector. The program targets opportunities that have the potential to provide a new impact on the sector. Uh, products to market, small projects, so the purpose is to support growth of Alberta's agricultural industries by supporting the development of new products and or processes, commercialization of new products in new markets, and expansion into local, domestic, and international markets. And this grant is uh, up to $50,000. So there's Stream A, which are company-led initiatives, and Stream B, which are initiatives led by uh, the international market development team, so my team. Uh, value added products to market is very similar to number two, uh, just that the grant minimum is, is uh, 50,000 and the maximum is 500,000. Uh, so I just wanted to point out that uh, some eligible activities for grants number two and three on the slide there include label and package development, uh, export preparation and planning, so that would be your export plan, and market development. So in addition to that, uh, these two grants can help offset the cost of purchasing equipment, third-party expenses for market research, conference free fees, as well as travel-related costs such as flights and hotels during your market development activities. Um, so of course, most of these trips are on hold due to the pandemic, but one day um, we'll be able to travel again, I'm sure, and you can tap into these grants. Um, just one more thing to point out is that, uh, unfortunately, these grants are all closed right now. Um, so I encourage you to sign up for program notifications uh, for when they do reopen. So before I introduce um, our guest speaker today, 
Uh, we want to do a, a couple of quick polls to get a feel for uh, who's in the audience. So, so I'll just launch them here. If you could take a, a couple seconds to just fill out the questions, that would be greatly appreciated. Maybe 20 more seconds here. Okay. Okay, so thanks for participating in that, uh, everyone. Um, I'm not sure if you can see on your screen the results of the polls, but it looks like uh, we don't have any co-packers currently on the call. And uh, we do have some folks that export to the US, which is great. Okay, so why don't we get uh, started with the webinar then? Um, I know there have been a lot of webinars lately, but I think this one is pretty unique and uh, you'll certainly find some value in it for your business. Um, so I'd now like to introduce our presenter, uh, Ron Lewis with Tra Trajectory. Ron has over 35 years in the food and beverage industry with uh, real world experience as a national sales manager, brand owner, uh, board member, international sales advisor, and he's a business owner himself. Ron has consulted for and represented companies such as Nestle, Conagra, Kellogg, Saputo, uh, Quaker, Arla, Yoplait, and Sara Lee. He has broad channel experience in CPG, food service, in-store food service, specialty, natural products, uh, drug, C-store, and e-commerce. Ron has a proven track record uh, helping organizations reach that next level of growth, revenue, and profitability. He has a comprehensive understanding of key corporate functions including sales, marketing, branding, operations, distribution, and sourcing. Ron is currently consulting as a co-packing director for multiple firms, as well as working with brands to secure co-backers uh, for their own production needs. Uh, so with that, I'll pass it over to you, Ron. Great, thank you very much, Evan. Um, today we're gonna be, um, first I wanna say thank you very much for joining us. I've had the, the uh, privilege and pleasure to be in Alberta and Calgary and Edmonton and actually working with a couple of uh, manufacturers um, in the province. Um, we had a meeting in Seattle in January, on the 23rd of January, when we had Alberta, BC and a couple of companies from Saskatchewan right before everything kind of tilted to COVID-19 and we had uh, 42 different companies in Seattle uh, that I led a meeting on exporting the U.S. So um, got a few folks perhaps on the on the uh, meeting today with us there. Today we're going to be a, quite a bit uh, leaning towards the practicality of the co-packing relationship between a manufacturer and a co-packing client. Uh, I'm going to pop back and forth here. I apologize. I've got multiple screens in here. So if you see me leaning over here, it's I've got a couple of screens here as well. So. Um, in addition to just today, I want to encourage you, there's some, uh, on the Al Alberta government, on their website, there's some very good white papers on co-packing. I encourage you to take a look at those. Um, co-packing, co-manufacturing, 
uh, there's a lot of different names for the activities that are involved between a company that uh, manufactures products perhaps um, for their own brand and then have excess production capacity and they fill that excess production capacity for producing for other companies under other brands. Um, that's what a co-packer does. Uh, you will hear, you'll see actually on one of those governmental papers where they're talking about a co-packer, but that company actually is a repacker. Um, and uh, there's just so many different services that companies do. So that company takes finished products from companies and then rebundles them into perhaps into a food service pack, into a club store pack, into a C store pack where there's smaller individual SKUs per bundle. So there's lots of services that different companies provide. Um, currently, I'm working on a number of different projects, uh, just so you know that I'm, I'm kind of in this. So I've got a project with the company out of the Yukon that we're actually having uh, their product co-packed in BC, I'm working with a company in um, Seattle that is research been searching for a co-packer and we finally found one but we couldn't find one in the pacific northwest we found one in vancouver that we're looking on to have manufacturing some products for uh, a firm that's located here in seattle and the clients is a co-packer in the ice cream uh, category plant-based products here in the greater Seattle area, we've got clients from around the world, uh, clients that are based out of Italy. We're producing their US products to their specifications. In fact, on that one, because it's an Italian company, I actually had to go source spring water. Uh, they, they wanted spring water versus the water that was just naturally in the area of the production facility. And so we've gone to the point of, of hiring tanker trucks to go in pick up uh, 2,500 gallons of spring water from a special location here in the Pacific Northwest and trucking that all the way into the production facility. Uh, it kind of, you have to do what you have to do to make it happen. And so uh, there's a lot of things involved with being successful in the business. So wanna jump in first and, and um, talk a little about, about why do companies need co-packers? And there's a number of different reasons why there's co-packers uh, in relationships. One of the first ones you'll see as you get in the co-packing business, or perhaps you are in search of a co-packer, is that there is a company or an entrepreneur that has a brand or has a product, they've developed this, they don't have a production facility, uh, they would like to take this product to market, and they are in need of a production facility in addition to the facility, they lack the skills that uh, they have in a, in a manufacturing facility that has the knowledge of all that has to happen to produce a product, a commercialized formula at a co-packer versus a kitchen formula that may be just out of somebody's garage or out of somebody's home, or they've done it in a small um, community kitchen, but now you want to transition over, you need to have a co-packer. Those co-packers also have the understanding of food safety, regulations, proper certifications, and all that needs to happen to make a product safe. So you've got an entrepreneur that's looking for someone to pack something for them. Another category or area is that as a company needs to expand their brand with new products they can't produce in their existing facilities and that uh, and, or other co-packing facilities. So I'll give you an example. Um, this is a great way to go out also <clears throat> and search for new accounts, a very large. So we produce at one of my co-packers here. We do a lot of plant-based uh, ice cream and uh, products in, in that uh, category. And um, I was researching some brands that have had great development on the refrigerated side. So a plant-based product that company that produces yogurts, smoothie drinks, uh, butters, other things that are plant-based. But in research, I found out that they did not have a, uh, an ice cream product that their brand naturally, with the brand equity they have, would naturally transition into an ice cream product. Uh, finally, was able to reach someone at corporate headquarters, and now they are in the process of 
analyzing that. And in fact, we're, we're in the running as a potential co-packer for that business. The great thing about that is those folks' brands are probably already in 1,800 to 2,200 stores. So the volume that can be built immediately uh, is fantastic for, for a co-packer. Um, and uh, our co-packing facility has the certifications needed that fit, and I knew this up front, that fit what, um, what was uh, on their website, on their company attributes, and I knew that we could fulfill everything that they, they had on the attributes of their other products. So somebody wants to expand their brand and they just don't have the production facility for a new product category. So also there's a manufacturer that just needs to increase production um, for the product because sales have outgrowth, uh, grown their current facility. So they need to have additional production uh, capacity. They got to go to a co-packer and it could be something like a project I was working on a couple of years ago that we knew going into it, they were going to expand their production facility. We had probably a 14 to 18 month window that we'd be co-packing for them, but we all knew this up front and that's fine. We were all happy to have that piece of business and happy to take care of that client. So there's companies that just need to have expansion. Um, um, manufacturing until they're able to produce that quality uh, of a product themselves and quantity. It's also a company that needs to just provide new products or stay ahead of their competitors. So I have gone to companies and um, been able to say, you've got a great product mix here, but you also have a strong competitor and that competitor has products over in these categories. We could help co-pack or co-manufacture a product to help you expand your brand. So it's just identifying companies that don't have the ability to expand into new categories because they, they're just not there in that category. Uh, Coke backers also have the ability to produce new packaging that they've got uh, existing equipment on their facility, but that client um, just isn't in that category, such as there's a beverage version that gets produced out of a powdered product. Um, there's a frozen version of a custard or a yogurt. There's a retail size package of a food service product, or maybe you need to have something uh, of your product produced into a, a portion control. So I work with a, um, a sauce company that uh, not only can produce bulk sauces, soups, and things like that, but they also can do portion control into single serve portions, and they, that's what they do. They co-pack for other people there. So we could just make those PCs or we could produce the whole product line. So um, those are different areas where people are looking for a co-packer. They just have a need. They don't have the ability because it, you know, you're going to open up a new factory. It could cost you millions. I was on a, a call yesterday with a, a North American company that deals a lot with plant-based products and there is a shortage of aseptic uh, packaging producers around North America. There just is so much volume, there's a very little excess production capacity. I, I, I told her, man, something ought to open up. Somebody needs to open up and build another plant. And, and the minimum uh, investment is 20 million. So not a lot of, a lot of organizations are gonna drop 20 to 25 million for a new plant. Um, unless you've got some pretty good ideas of, of securing business in advance. So there's a lot of demand out here. Um, and if you're a co-packer, um, you have the opportunities to build, uh, build a pretty good clientele. So let's walk through just the basics of developing a successful co-packing relationship with a client. The, the first thing that I'm going to recommend that you have is what I call a corporate capabilities presentation. And this basically is a, is a simple presentation that you're gonna to provide to potential clients that's gonna answer all the basic questions about these core areas. Your equipment capabilities, your packaging capabilities, the certifications of your plant, and all the areas where you're gonna show a co-packer your general production capabilities. In that, you're going to provide pictures, and this is what I do, pictures of the factory, pictures of your equipment, pictures of your warehouse and your storage facility, 
pictures of what your sanitation efforts, what those look like, all the way down to a palletization process of, yeah, this is where we wrap our pallets, this is how we do it, and here's pictures of that. This is an introduction, it's kind of like the first impression that you're gonna create that gives the opportunity for you to say, hi, here's who we are. And this is my, when I go into creating the initial relationship between a co-packer and a potential client, one of the first things that I do is, hey, here's my, my general corporate capability presentation. One of the other things that a, a co-packer should do is make available pictures about your production facilities, including the out exterior of your building. And the reason for that is, there's, uh, there's a lot of people that really understand, they've done research and they, they know kind of what a co-packer is, what it looks like that they want to have. And so they want to know, do they have a receiving dock? Do they have a separate, you know, um, shipping dock? Do they have on the exterior of their building when I take a look at that? Am I seeing a backup generator? Am I seeing redundant compressors? What am I going to see in that facility that gives me confidence that this is where I want to hang my hat. And um, more, you know, very importantly is there's third party audits that happen for brands. So if I'm compacting your brand, um, and you'll see in some documents coming up, you, if you're Walmart, Walmart wants to interview and take a, take a look potentially and send an auditor, whether it's their own or a third party, over to inspect that facility. So uh, that co-packer uh, client wants to be confident that that impression that that co-packer presents is also a good impression of their own company. Um, so within your uh, document that you have there that you're going to provide on your um, general co-packing capabilities, you want to be able to define all of your current equipment. You want to provide, this is what I do, we, we provide pictures of all of our pieces of equipment. We want to show everything down to what kind of pumps we've got, what kind of mixers we've got, what kind of depositors we've got, molds that we've got for the depositors, um, how do we, um, uh, what our holding tanks look like, our filling equipment look like, what does our metal detector do, uh, what is our scaling, uh, packaging, our labeling, our palletized equipment. I'm showing people um, that we are a full-fledged 100% manufacturing facility and we can produce your product. And I'm answering many of your questions well in advance of you asking them by this presentation. So um, it's, I think this is critical uh, for you to be able to provide. I, I also provide it all the way down to pulling out existing um, whether it's my product or I can hide a brand on a pallet if another brand doesn't want to share that, you know, where the product's being co-packed. I actually show pallet patterns. So I'll take pictures of what a pallet pattern is currently uh, of what we provide for co-packers. So it's a uh, 10 per tier, 15 high, X amount of units per case. I can put 4,500 units on a pallet it's shrunk wrap. Here's the label that's stuck to the side of the pallet. The pa that label shows the traceability information um, and uh, the SKU information and everything that's there. So we're building confidence. We're building confidence, and that's the most important thing. If you're looking for a co-packer, these are things that you're looking for from a client when you start the process. You want to know as much information about them. Um, all we all have... Is, is, is time. And uh, if we can be confident that this manufacturer is providing all the information in advance, it makes it easier to make a decision that this is the right manufacturer, or perhaps you have to go find somebody else to co-pack for you. Uh, one of the more important things that um, uh, you really want to show is separate pictures of all the various packaging options that your facility can uh, do. So I literally will lay out on a table and take pictures and present all the different types of packaging that we currently have. The other thing that I will, I want to encourage you um, if you're building that co-packing business is understand all the 
various capabilities of your equipment. So for example, we've got a filling line that uh, at one of these facilities and we're set up currently for a 3.65 ounce container, a 14 ounce container and a 16 ounce container. That's what we currently do. However, the capabilities of that filling line can actually go from three ounces up to, that line can go up to about, that can go to 16. We have another uh, filling, uh, filler line that actually can go from three ounces to 64 ounces. And then we have separate attachments for, um, that we can show that we can fill a one and a half, two and a half, three gallon bucket of ice cream, food service, consumer packaged goods, and perhaps like a unique package that you may have that goes into um, college and university or, or hospital or something like that where you need a small portion for single serve. Uh, so I'm communicating all the different options that I've got because it's not just what I make now as a co-packer, it's what I have the opportunity to to do because a lot of companies have a multiple uh, sizes of, of SKUs, packing sizes. So I want to prove to you that I can take care of you and all of your business there. Very importantly is that you provide uh, copies of what your certifications are. So you need to consider and offer all the certifications you've got for your facility. Um, this is this is critical. And I don't know, Evan, if we have we have we passed out the, um, the information here on the packet? Uh, not yet, Ron. I can... Okay, we'll get that out. So, I'm, so what we'll do is on there, what you're going to see is from my um, right off of one of my presentations, my, it's going to show what are the quality assurance things that um, my plant has. So this list is going to say, I'm, I'm an SQF certified uh, facility, and here's my SQF number as assigned by that that uh, testing agency. Uh, I we are inspected by Washington State Department of Agriculture, licensed and FDA inspected. We're organic certified through the Washington State Department of Agriculture. We have GMP pr practices, and we're audited and approved for GMP practices. We have got basic food safety and HACCP programs. Uh, we've got identified, highly identified SOP systems. We are kosher certified by two different kosher organizations, OU and OK. We're Walmart category approved and we're, we're category approved facility number 36193718, which that's real. So that tells them, oh yeah, really, that's, they, they are. And we also have a full traceability program in that facility. Um, and so that's your quality assurance. That's what people are looking for. On some things that I don't put on paper, uh, which you can do the same thing too, is we actually have for three years now been um, uh, very proud that we produce for Starbucks corporately. We produce a product for Starbucks for the roastery and the reserve stores. It's a high-end product. And for two, two and a half years, the only one's producing it for them. Um, Starbucks is perhaps the most challenging audit that we have. Um, it, it's, they're very intense when they come in and, and they go to third party providers. So that's something I will, we will share and we can share that because there was press releases with um, our, my, my co-packer stating that we've got the business with Starbucks so we could communicate that. We also will communicate on this information that we have a whole test and re release uh, um, policy for third-party lab for E. coli, salmonella, and listeria. And then on that, on this document, we're, we're gonna show, we're gonna show the actual certification pieces of, uh, pieces of paper. We're gonna, um, as requested, we will send copies of any certification from any organization to show that yes, we've had this done. So that's kind of your plant, that's the equipment, that's your, that's your uh, certifications, key things to it. The next basic thing that you have to have in your relationship uh, for both sides is a, is a mutually, uh, it's a mutual non-disclosure agreement. This is a critical agreement and I want, I want to point out one thing that's just key. The word that I used was mutual. Be, be concerned on 
either side, co-packer or client, that, that, that the NDA is not a one-sided agreement. Uh, we've had to go back and forth probably 50% of the time uh, and, and have um, NDAs revised to make sure that both companies are protected and that both companies' um, uh, processes, formulas, um, the ingredients that they use, everything is protected and nothing's going to be shared uh, without written approval or flat out not shared. So uh, NDA is critical and that's one of the first things you have to have up to. Um, Evan, if you could pop up that new client information form, um, that is one of the things that you, you, you want to start with in dealing with a new customer. This is a, um, a basic form that you're going to fill your, your own out, create one, but this uh, is uh, key to have with a client, and it's basically saying, um, asking questions that the co-packer fills out this form, and it says, here's what I'm requesting you to produce. Here's the definition of what the packaging is. Here's the quantities. Here's the frequencies. And you're going to go through and have just a questionnaire for the potential client to fill out so you get a really good understanding of what they're looking for. Um, and, and right from the beginning, you may be able to say, I can do it, or I, I'm, I'm so sorry, I can't do it. Um, and here's a couple of the reasons why. We, we just don't have that packaging equipment. Um, that packaging equipment is a $50,000 investment. If you would like to provide that packing equipment for us as a piece of machinery um, that you bring in and we warehouse here, that's something we can have a discussion. But at this particular point, we're not able to do that. You're going to get an idea. Is this, is this the right relationship or do we know go down the road? The, the next extremely important um, document that you would have is what I call uh, the general terms for tolling production. Uh, one of my clients has got, it's, it's eight pages long in, in like 12 font. Um, it is going through most of all the major questions from a manufacturing standpoint. Uh, everything, uh, I'll go through some of the key things here, everything that's involved in this. And, and it's a document that's signed. Uh, when you get this, the final part of this done, it actually is going to provide what the tolling, the estimated tolling fees are going to be for the relationship between uh, the co-packer producing for the client. So in this agreement, it's going to house the, uh, the, the contractual things. And here's some of the major things that's going to be involved in this, which is key. What is your purchase order policy? So I need a purchase order. Uh, and it needs to have this information on it. I need the SKU, product description, pack and size, go through all the things that you want to have on a purchase order document for the products that are to be co-packed. Um, you're going to have in this document, what are the standard lead times? It varies. A lot of manufacturers just say it's a 30-day lead time, and I can tell you right now, um, we have one of our production facilities right now uh, is, I think it's December 28th, is the next open date on the calendar for co-packing. Now we can move some things around with permission from a client to have to do an emergency, emergency production for someone, but the reality is um, people send in hard and fast POs. When you send in a PO, you, you own the date on the calendar. Well, that's agreed to uh, on this. It's gonna tell in there, the PO, the lead times, cancellation policies, uh, which is very key, and you need to have this understood up front, is so somebody sends in a PO, um, and then they, you know, eight days before the production date, they go, oh, something didn't arrive, I didn't get a package, I didn't get an ingredient, we can't do it. No, it's not an easy thing to just, you, you can't have downtime in a plant. So you will try as a co-packer everything you can to fill that production date, probably should have some processes in, in place to have that uh, thought through in advance. But the reality is on, on paper, on the document, if I can't fill that production date, I'm charging you 
for that full day's worth of, of profit that I would have got that whole production day. Uh, that's in the document. So cancellation policy, extremely critical. It just needs to be communicated up front. What are the payment terms, processing for payments? Uh, then you're gonna get into the, the, the guts to it. What is the tolling estimated cost per container? What is the uh, tolling cost? If, and, I'll, and I'll tell you one thing that we do is hypothetically we're gonna say the tolling cost is 50 cents a unit. Um, and it's gonna cost you, um, you know, you, we do 10,000 of them, so your invoice is gonna be $5,000. So um, it's due, and then you got your due date. What we say is, if you pay within payment terms of like 210 net 11, we're gonna give you a 5%, well, historically it's 210 net 11. If you pay within the 11 days, we're gonna give you a 5% discount. Over that, it's gonna cost you 5% more if you don't pay within terms. Basically what it's doing is a major incentive just to pay the regular tolling fee on time. It's more of a penalty for being late, so. You're gonna get your package size uh, for each SKU. You're gonna you're gonna discuss what your quantities are per batch, production runs, what are your minimum production runs, volume expectations. By the way, I'm whipping through this stuff. You're gonna get this all in, on, in writing. So, um, and it, you're gonna go through everything in here. You gotta go to the estimated number of pallets per production run, shrinkage expectations. You're gonna talk about your lab testing. Um, at one of our plants, we include in our tolling fee um, three main, so Listeria, E. coli, and Salmonella. Uh, we send every batch out for testing for those three. And um, we have a whole test and release, which I think everybody should have. We won't release that product until we get those back, but we pay for those. Any other tests that are being done, We'll, we can make those available through either our testing lab or third-party testing, but the COPAC uh, client will pay for the other ones. In here should be your allergen disclaimer. Also, your policy for what happens for uh, finished products when it has to move out of the factory, um, unless you have a, a warehouse of your own that you are going to charge that client for storage. You're gonna discuss what happens, who provides what ingredients, what materials, all that. And you're gonna have a uh, one document th that we've got is that we will share with you um, the only ingredients that we've got are these core. And let's say it's, you know, for making ice cream, it's milk, cream, uh, non-fat dry milk, sugar, non-GMO non pure cane sugar. After that, you're 100% as a client you are 100% responsible for providing all the other ingredients. There are other companies that basically will say, and it's just how you run your company, I'll provide all the ingredients and then I will charge you for those ingredients. Usually when that's done and the co-packer does the work for research, purchasing, receiving, invoicing, paying the bills and all that stuff, usually there's a markup that happens on those ingredients. Uh, so uh, those are some of the core things that are that are there. Um, on both sides of, of companies, when a company comes in and says, this is my product that I'd like to produce, there's other things in advance as a co-packer you need to have completely ready and knowledgeable ready to roll. Okay, I'm a gluten-free facility or separately, I'm a certified gluten-free facility, but Here's what I do. I've got processes where I can and approved, I can produce a gluten-free product with these um, sanitational processes. You may have to put in your packaging, gluten-free, made in a factory that does produce whatever, um, as full disclosure. You need to talk about what your allergen protocols are. So all of the different things that you do um, that you can offer these wonderful extra add-ons to your capabilities is great. And you wanna be able to have those totally ready to communicate. You certainly have to have um, the minimum order quantities, MLQs, defined in advance. So what are the batch sizes? What are the minimum order quantities? By type, by product, by packaging, uh, so that um, it's understood up front 
what the expectations are. For example, in our plant, we basically say at the ice cream plant, we basically say we do 1500 gallons of mix is a minimum run that we do in a day. Great, that's what we do. Um, now, would we go to somebody and say, we can't do 800 or we can't do 500 or whatever it is? No, we can, but you're gonna pay for the entire day's production time because if I can't produce something else in that same time period, uh, by the time I sanitize, clean, do all the other things with equipment and the, the plant, I've lost an entire production day. That's fine, we may be able to do, do it a smaller run, but you're gonna pay for the entire cost of doing a production run for all day. What you also can communicate what happens if you split two or three products within a, within a shift. So I can do, there's a lot of companies, depending on the number of SKUs that they've got, um, I sure hope, just for this one plant at least, that um, you've got everything in, in even numbers, twos, fours, sixes, because really we don't really want to do more than two flavors in a day. Um, and we'll work with you on, and, and you will work, everybody work together on, what does that mean? Well, we're not going to do chocolate first, then vanilla. So we're going to do vanilla and then chocolate. And then we have to watch it. Uh, and be concerned about other products that are done. Can you do a product with a seed? Can you do a, a strawberry? I don't know because if there's even the smallest type of particles that could get in, in the pipes and the lines and the mixers and then the tanks. So you really have to know what you can produce or you can't produce and understand what the, what the products are uh, that are being made. And the same things with bakery products, depending on what inclusions are or spices that may go into something. So when we get into um, uh, payment terms where critical, we usually what we do is we talk about when you cut a purchase order, you're going to pay 50% down at date of purchase order, 50% of the estimated tolling fee. So you got a purchase order, it says I want 50,000 units, 50,000 units is two days worth of production, and it's, we'll go back to 50 cents, so it's 50,000 at 50 cents you're gonna to have to write me a check for 25,000 bucks to hold your production date. So everybody know this all up in front, okay? Now, as those relationships um, and, and the balance of the other 50% is gonna be paid at the release of the product to the customer. After the whole test and release, um, uh, the test lab tests have come back. Uh, now, after the relationship is um, matured, yeah, you can transition that down to 25% down or however your, your relationship is gonna work from there. But initially, we always work on 50% down with a purchase order to hold your spot. Um, one of the important parts of that relationship when you're working with somebody that's new or if they're bringing out new SKUs, they're adding new SKUs, is what are test runs. Test runs as a co-packer, there's two types of test runs that, that at least I, I, I talk about. Uh, there's a simple bench test. So this is something where you're going to, um, the co-packer is gonna receive, um, and, and not in these days all the time, but the client is welcome to come in. We'll do a bench test sample uh, with that formula for bench test sizes. And we just wanna make sure that the way that we're going to produce this product meets your expectations. So we understand um, the SOPs, how that product's gonna be produced, and we're gonna just do a small bench test. Um, again, I'll just come back to ice cream. We could do as little as 12, to 15, uh, 12 gallons, 15 gallons per skew or per flavor to do a bench test. What we do is pretty much that's a two to four hour time period, usually from start to finish, because you have costs for sanitizing, cleaning in advance of the equipment and the, product, the test area, and then cleaning afterwards. Um, companies range their charge from $75 to $150 per hour. Um, at some plants, we just say it's going to be $400 for up to three hours of bitch testing. Um, the second one is the full production run. So now we've got confidence from the bench test that we understand your product. We can now produce your product. However, um, we need to do a run with the full factory and, and do that. Most companies understand, co-packers understand what their 
cost is of operating their, their facility in, in a day. Some facilities, are, um, when you're co-packing, you're only taking part of the production facility. You're not taking the whole facility. So you allocate the cost based on how are we going to square footage, time, output, whatever it is that you base your, your uh, uh, percentages on. But you're going to charge them for the whole factory for the whole day. So we have in mind uh, one of our factories, somewhere between $8,500 and $10,000 a day for a standard. That's our cost for standard production run. So we could come in here, we're gonna produce, we're gonna mix your products, we're gonna blend your products, we're gonna put it together, we're gonna run it through machinery, we're gonna bake it, cook it, steam it, whatever we're gonna do, uh, run it through a continuous freezer and make ice cream. We're gonna actually do the whole production run and that's gonna be the cost of a full, just budget and plan, that's gonna be a cost for a full day's production run. Um, what you hope is that uh, you can, at, that's the time when you're going to get a finished product. And during those test runs, we have actually had people have to play with formulas. They've had to increase uh, um, to get the flavor output that they want to have at a commercialized facility. Uh, so we've had tweaking of formulations. We've had, oh, it's really not enough nuts in that or there's too many nuts, that's when we tweak the formulas to get the final formula. The hope is and the goal is that um, perhaps you're gonna be able to have something at the end of those test runs that could be sellable uh, if we've got final packaging that we're using or at least it's something that's donatable, uh, something we can do with that product. Um, but um, plan on all the ingredients um, cost to be part of this test all of the time of the production facility to be part of the test. It's an expensive thing, but a factory really can't, really can't give you the final product until they've run a full test run. So um, on your tolling, um, usually it's done by units. Uh, you can chart by, you know, um, pound, unit, um, cases, however you decide that you're going to provide your estimated tolling fee, the final tolling fee. What happens also with that final test run is you're going to be able to calculate what your output expectation is. We could walk into the whole thing and expect that we're going to get 25,000 units out of a shift. And what we find out um, after the full product production run is, no, we only got 15 or, hey, we got 30. So that's the importance of doing a full uh, production test run. Really gets your idea of what true costs are gonna be um, when you agree then to your final tolling fees. A, a co-packer, in addition to this, a co-packer can also offer R&D services uh, for product development. They also can um, offer um, product development services and charge for that. Um, you should also be communicating your warehousing uh, capabilities and any logistics support that you're going to offer there. Uh, you want to make sure that the manufacturer has, a, a client has a minimum, this is Ron talking, $2 million um, product liability insurance. Uh, you don't produce anything or go into an agreement with somebody unless they've got that. And as a co-packer, um, you need to have a traceability program for a potential product recalls. And as a, if you're a client, you don't want a facility that doesn't have a traceability program so that um, I know one manufacturing facility is here um, didn't have a traceability program, had to pull off every carton of their own product off the shelf, small family owned business and it cost them a million dollars. Um, that's what, you know, they got 300,000 off of something uh, insurance wise, but uh, they ended up about a million dollars themselves, a loss because of a recall because they didn't have um traceability to say, oh, it was batch this, batch this, batch this, where maybe have been 30,000 lost, not, not a million. Um, the other thing is offer logistic support. Be able to go and say, hey, this is, uh, we've got contacts for trucking, dry, refrigerated, and frozen. We also have, uh, this is a third-party warehouse that we, you can put your materials coming in. 
pre from uh, finished materials going out. So it's a full, you want to provide all the services to make that client as successful as possible. One of the things as a co-packer that you need to do is discuss well in advance what your risk acceptance level is. And that, that I say that as um, I suggest personally, that no one single one of your customers is more than 20, 22% of your overall company capabilities or your overall business. So when somebody comes knocking through the door and says, wow, cool, you've got excess production capacity, I've picked up Costco, let's go. Well, I've, I've, I've owned Kirkland Signature Brands, I, I produced for Costco, I owned a brokerage firm that did millions and millions with Costco. Uh, you have a 13-week life. That's all you've got when you get into Costco. They're not signing any guarantee for longer than their purchase orders, which is going to last in a 13-week time period. Um, so I wouldn't want to put my factory up against somebody's Costco business. Um, it can come and it can go. Um, in all of this here, and you'll see some more information. Uh, I don't want to take up a whole lot of my time, but you're going to see a whole lot of information here uh, on how do I develop new opportunities to pick up new clients, uh, new co-packing clients. And um, there's a lot of ways here. I walk up and down the aisles of the grocery store, even now with my mask, uh, and um, do it at crazy hours of the day uh, or night and uh, staying away from people. And I take pictures of shelves and I find opportunities uh, for brands that are in the market that I think I can serve whether as an additional co-packer or as a new opportunity. Uh, I also talk to all of my equipment companies, all of my ingredient supplying companies, all of my packaging companies, and tell them we're moving heavily into co-packing. I'm sitting on 40% excess capacity. Um, I, would, I would like for you guys to keep your ears out for opportunities for me and my business. There's also other opportunities, put your name in some co-packer list, like especially Food Association. Uh, and um, government agencies, uh, the province has a co-packing list, uh, do that. The last thing, uh, some of the last things that you're gonna see on here is I, I've included some newsletters for folks, one of the questions they had is, um, where do we get industry information? So I've got a couple of links to some websites um, to go there. Evan, I popped over a little bit longer than we wanted to, but ready to jump into some questions. All right, thank you so much, Ron. Um, that was fantastic. I'm just gonna uh, have one more slide here to share with folks before we get into questions. Uh, so uh, maybe it'll help you guys think of some questions, questions you may have. Uh, so just pointing out one additional webinar that uh, we have next month. Uh, so Ron will be presenting again. It's, uh, there you go, Thursday, October 15th, same time, one o'clock. Um, and this one is on the food service sector. Um, so this session, again, can be found on Eventbrite, or uh, feel free to reach out to me and I can, I can send you the information as well. So with that, we might as well open it up to questions. Uh, please use the chat box um, on the bottom of your screen, and uh, we'd, be, we'd be happy to answer them. Um, so just a question that kind of rolled in uh, at the beginning here. Uh, maybe it was in relation to my, my, my report there on private label, but um, are there any major private label trade shows in the U.S.? Um, private label, yeah. The PLMA, private label um, merchants associate or market associate. Yeah, PLMA has one. Um, there's, so there's a big difference between co-packing and private labeling, though a company can do both. Co-packing co is you're producing somebody else's brand, somebody else's formula, somebody else's recommended packaging. Private labeling is I produce as a factory. I produce these products. I've already got these things done. I'm just going to slap your label on it. So that's private labeling. Um, so, there are, um, there's that. One of the things I want you all to go to is an organization called Range Me, R-A-N-G-E-M-E. -E. Look at Range Me on the site. That is a site where you can go and upload your products, uh, including all the way down to delivered pricing that you need to get. But uh, there's probably, you know, 400 of the top U.S. buyers um, use Range Me now when they're looking and sourcing uh, new products. So you can 
you can throw something in there even as a co-pack or a private label company. Um, pop in uh, one of your own brands and then create the relationship to be able to talk about co-packing or private labeling down the road from there. So yeah, private label manufacturers association, PLMA. Um, so you, you can see this question too in your chat there, Ron, uh, Maybe. from Mike, uh, yeah. regarding charging for production or product development versus production. Yeah. So is, should it be the responsibility of the client or the co-man to own the product? The, the client should, the, well, the client should own the product. It's not, it's a, it's, the client should own the product. Now, what you do is you come in, you're, you're, you're coming in as a client and you're saying, here's, here's what I've got. I produced this in my kitchen. I produced this in a, in, a, in a small batch. I'm doing this on a food truck, whatever it is. Now I want to take it to marketplace. Uh, you need to go to a food scientist probably to have a formulation put together. Now, you guys got a great opportunity there in Leduc at the Food Processing Development Center. I would, um, that's absolutely a place that uh, I would point people to. But your co-packing facility, you can have, if you've got excess time for your senior management uh, production people to do R&D or ownership, to do R&D and, and product development, yeah, but you charge for it. Um, and you're going to charge 150 an hour or whatever you're going to charge or more. Uh, you may say to do it, it may be $1,000 per formula. Um, but yeah, uh, that can be done. It, it should be owned by the client. Um, that's why you have non-disclosure agreements involved in too. You basically are saying, I own the formula. So um, if you want to go to a co-packer, and if the co-packer wants to private label for somebody and the co-packer wants to own the brand, if that's okay with the client, it's between the two of you. But uh, realize that if the manufacturer owns the brand, you don't as a client. And, you know, there's so many things that goes into it. You know, I'm working on a project for, for a guy and um, just for slotting fees to get in retail into the U.S. to grab the first basically it's forty dollars for per skew per store um this this young gentleman's looking at rolling out to x amount of thousands of stores he's got a four hundred thousand dollar bill just for slotting to go into retail based on the number of store doors that he wants to be in uh, so it's expensive don't don't pretend it's not or or understand in, in your research that it's not inexpensive to get in as a consumer package good cpg business so all right, thanks, Ron. Another question here. Uh, so when do the two parties sign off on the NDA, before or after a test run? No, no, immediately. You sign off before you, you, you it's, I actually email NDAs 90% uh, of the time after the first conversation on the phone. Um, that's, that's, when it's, that's when it's being done. It's done to me. So as the co-packer, I'm going to send you my um, general company uh, capabilities presentation. You look at that. You say, yeah, I like it. We want to talk. Boom, NDA sign. Mm -hmm. uh, just another question. I think you kind of answered this at the end of your presentation there, but if you have anything else to add, um, how do I find companies interested in co-packing? At my facility sure no it's a it's a great question so uh I'll do what i do I, I do walk up and down the the aisles i do a ton of research on the web i will go into uh i will go on to um the kroger website for purchasing of products i i've got i i i get a lot of newsletters and um i just i troll i cast the net very wide and uh I have, you know, I've got the old white, the old uh, sticky white, uh, uh, I got a whiteboard and then I've got the big old sticky paper up here and I've got like 32 different potential co-packing clients for, the, for my ice cream co-packer. And it's just because I'm trolling, I'm, I'm looking for it. And one of the big things that, that happens in, in, I've got another business called 49 Degrees North and um, what I'm encouraging, and you guys need to hear that, this is that it's actually closer for a buyer in San Diego or LA 
it's geographically, it's closer to buy from Calgary or Edmonton than it is from, from uh, Chicago or the East Coast. It's, it's, it's less mileage. It's also, if you have to go over the Rockies or something like that in the winter, you're gonna, you're gonna have lost trucks, you're gonna have delay shipment, buy from a company in, in Western Canada. And that's one of the things I'm pushing on. Um, so go after manufacturers, go after companies that are headquartered on the East Coast to be the West Coast co-packer for that brand. And that's what we do a lot is that's where I, I go after guys. Hey, build your business. You're shipping from Philadelphia all the way to San Diego. Tell you what, I'll pack for you for the West Coast. Just give me the 13 Western states. Okay, thanks, Ron. Great advice. Uh, so it looks like uh, that's it for questions. And it's actually perfect because that's our time for today. Uh, so thanks again, Ron, for that uh, fantastic presentation. Yeah, appreciate it. My pleasure. Yeah. I appreciate it. And, and uh, you've got the contact information, Evan. I'm, I'm very happy if somebody wants to shoot me an email, um, happy to respond back and answer more questions. Right, perfect. Um, yeah, so thanks again, everyone, for uh, taking the time to listen in today. Um, I hope you found value in attending. And like Ron said, if you have any uh, further questions, like feel free to, to reach out. Um, so with that, I'll sign off and enjoy the rest of your day. Um, take care, everyone, and hope to see you uh, at the food service webinar. Goodbye for now.